This program contains real and reenacted violent combat scenes. Viewer discretion is advised. They're cold-blooded killers. The desperados on the deck of cards. The most wanted men in Iraq. These slaughterers lust for political power. And in their minds, the more havoc they wreak, the better their chances of seizing it. Here now are the stories of the gunfights that take them down. Shot by shot accounts. Told for the first time. Including never before seen footage of an actual raid. Shootout, Iraq's most wanted. Surrender and you might live. Resist and you'll crumble in a storm of lead. August 5th, 2004, 4 p.m. First Sergeant Justin LaHue and the 300 men of Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 4th Marine Regiment, are shooting their way onto one of the most ghastly and surreal battlefields in history. The immense 1,000-year-old Shia Muslim Cemetery in Najaf, Iraq. It's an eerie place for the Marines. But for the enemy fighters the Marines are chasing, several hundred Shia gunmen, commanded by most wanted insurgent leader Muqtada al-Sadr. The cemetery is home, and they've peppered it with hidden fighting positions and weapon stockpiles. The odds are against the Americans, but this is a fight that's been brewing for months, and the Marines are determined to settle it, here and now, once and for all. In the year and a half since the fall of Saddam Hussein, coalition forces have been steadily hunting down and killing or capturing Iraq's most wanted criminals. Now, in the summer of 2004, a name near the top of the most wanted list is that of militant Shia cleric Muqtada al-Sadr. He's a young man, 30 years old, and he's headquartered in the southern Iraqi city of Najaf, 100 miles south of Baghdad. Sadr is from that area. At the conclusion of fighting against Saddam Hussein, he had taken over the Najaf region and had started what he called his uh, um, Sadr's army or the uh, Mahdi militia. Muqtada Sadr is out to grab political power now that Saddam is out of the picture, and he has no plans to cooperate with coalition forces. The U.S. troops stabilizing Najaf at the moment are the 1,200 men of 1st Battalion, 4th Marines out of Camp Pendleton, California. Our mission was to go to Najaf, support the Najaf governor, and help build the National Guard unit that was there, the police forces, and to continue the reconstruction project that had been going on since the fall of Saddam. But Muqtada Sadr's militia continually harasses the local police and makes the Marines' job harder. The militia is made up of some 4,000 disenfranchised young men of the Shia faith, and they take refuge in Najaf's sacred old city and vast historic cemetery, which surround the Imam Ali Shrine, the most holy site in the Shia religion. Out of respect for Shia culture, coalition forces have agreed not to enter the sacred old city and cemetery. But Sadr's militiamen are taking advantage of the situation. They would routinely come out of the cemetery at night and attack the Iraqi main police station, which is located right across the street from the main intersection of the cemetery. The militiamen then quickly retreat to the sanctuary of the historic graveyard. But this afternoon, after one particularly brutal and sustained attack on police headquarters, the Marines have had enough. When the militiamen retreat into the safety of the cemetery, the Marines follow them. Here's the setup. 
Some 300 men from Charlie Company and part of Bravo Company, armed with M16s and squad automatic weapons, are chasing some 300 of the militiamen, armed with AK-47 assault rifles and RPGs. It's a haphazard, unruly fight over an incredibly obstructed and massive battleground. It would fatigue the Marine just by looking at the cemetery because the sight of the cemetery was endless and it completely surrounded as far as the eye could see. The Imam Ali Shrine is on a hill at one end of the burial ground with clusters of homes and aging public buildings encircling it. People of the Shia faith come from all over the world to see the shrine and so they have a thousand meters of really hotels and universities set up to educate. And that's all on a hill around this shrine that looks down on this huge cemetery. Many Shia from across the globe wish to be buried here near the shrine, hence the massive cemetery, a virtual city in itself of underground catacombs and crowded above-ground tombs and mausoleums, squeezed together in no particular order. The only way you can literally move 20 feet is by going over, around, squeezing through these huge mausoleums. As Marines move in search of the enemy, they try to respect the Muslim grave sites, but making their way through the jumbled environment is difficult and leads to a bizarre incident for First Sergeant LeHue. I'm kind of hopping on top of the crypt stones and in the middle of taking cover to non for mortar shots, I happen to jump from one crypt to the top of the other crypt and ended up falling through. I noticed a pretty pungent odor, and I looked over to my right, and there was a uh, woman inside of there. Uh, she had been dead for uh, probably a year or so that was inside of there. I kind of tried to see the humor and everything, so I just said, uh, excuse me, ma'am, sorry about the interruption. Stood up inside of there and brushed myself off and climbed up out of there. Marines have trouble spotting the insurgents because many are taking cover in the underground catacombs. The Americans attempt to clear them all, but many get overlooked. The Marines would fight uh, 100 meters. They'd have to clear back 50 meters because the militiamen would pop out of the catacombs. A 360 degree battlefront soon erupts. There was no really safe area. It was just where you were right now was the safe area. The shootout in the Najaf Cemetery wears on for 72 hours, with August temperatures climbing above 130 degrees in the heat of the day. Dehydration is a constant threat. But what some consider the most deadly threat of all emerges on day two. A skilled enemy sniper positions himself in a hotel building on the hill, overlooking the graveyard. He can pick and choose any Marine that exposes himself because he has the ultimate view from the top down, unobstructed in the front, of all the movements that are down in there. And we have the obstructed view looking from the ground up. And we're also looking at a multitude of random buildings, so we don't know where it's coming from. The sniper proceeds to pin the Marines down and make their lives miserable for the next few hours. We had Marines that were taking refuge behind the headstones. And as they were starting to move, the sniper would hit the top of the headstone or the side of the headstone at wherever they were trying to expose their body. And he would notch out, you'd see pieces of masonry fly. The sniper soon takes a victim. It's about 1 p.m. and now we're getting a head count and we're missing one Marine. He had taken refuge down in a little walled-in structure that was where one of the tombs was at, kind of out of sight, so we thought he's just slumping down, maybe taking a drink or whatever, but the corpsman didn't see him, so they had finally went down in there because he wasn't rogering up. First Sergeant LeHue and others eventually locate him he had already probably been in that position for 20 minutes. Uh, he had taken a sniper shot through his neck collar piece, uh, which is not meant to stop an impact of a 
straight on shot from a dragon off rifle. It's meant for fragmentation or anything else. It's not meant to stop the impact of the bullet. Just then, another oddity of fighting in the Muslim cemetery occurs. Despite the battle, five times a day, a call to prayer is sounded at the top of a nearby mosque. Each time that happened, the firing would stop. And the insurgents would either pray or they would take that time to say, this is holy time for five minutes. It happens now. And First Sergeant LeHue and three other Marines take advantage of the time to evacuate the Marine's body. The entire time this is happening, not a shot is going off or anything. And this took a good amount of time to, to get his body out of there. It was at least 20 minutes. The sniper holds his fire well after the prayer time has expired. In my professional opinion, whoever that sniper was had enough respect. He knew he killed that kid, and he knew what we were doing. And I think to this day, he allowed us to remove that kid off the battlefield. And once he knew we had our dead off the battlefield, he engaged target's opportunity again. The sniper is shooting from several rooms and balconies of a hotel building overlooking the cemetery. He changes his firing position to another room in the hotel after every shot so that even if the Marines see his muzzle flash, they'll miss him if they fire at him. The hotel is several hundred yards distant, but the Marines soon come up with a way to detect him and pin him down. There are Marine tanks present, positioned on the only major road through the cemetery. When the Marines spot the sniper shooting from one of the hotel rooms, they ask the tank gunners to fire at the room and destroy it. Eventually, the tanks destroy so much of the hotel, the sniper has nowhere left to hide. After a certain sustained period of time of blasting, the sniper had disappeared. It just went away. Following the third day of fighting, Sadr's militiamen pull out of the cemetery and retreat into the buildings of the old city, surrounding the Imam Ali Shrine. By now, two battalions from the U.S. Army have arrived to reinforce the Marines. But coalition leaders will not allow U.S. troops to fire on the shrine because of its cultural significance. It was decided that the Iraqi army needs to be uh, the force that clears the shrine. And so we would do a series of raids to keep them off balance all the time we're training the Iraqi army to do the final assault. This process takes a couple of weeks. But by the evening of August 24th, two battalions of the Iraqi army are trained and ready. 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, punches into the old city first to clear the way. The initial target is a building numbered 61 on coalition maps. It's an old hotel that's being refurbished, and its interior is stripped clean. Unknown to the Marines, waiting inside in pitch black darkness, are four insurgent militiamen with a stockpile of rocket-propelled grenades. Najaf, Iraq. August 24, 2004, midnight. The men of 1st Battalion, 4th Marine Regiment are gunning for some of Iraq's most wanted henchmen, Muqtada al-Sadr and his insurgent Mahdi militia. The Marines have punched into Najaf's old city to prep for an assault on the famous Imam Ali Shrine. Sadr is using the shrine as a sanctuary from coalition troops. He's safe there for now because coalition commanders will not allow U.S. troops to enter the shrine. It's too culturally significant. But they've been training two battalions of Iraqi soldiers to go in and grab Sadr for them. The Iraqi battalions are finally ready to go. Tonight, Marine and Army forces are storming into the old city to gain a foothold and pave the way for the final assault. Here's the plan. Battalion 1-4, led by the 300 Marines of Charlie Company, will assault into the old city to seize buildings to gain a base of operations near the shrine. 
Two army battalions will launch a simultaneous assault on the other side of town. Then the two Iraqi battalions, each numbering 700 men, will take the shrine itself. It's estimated coalition forces might battle as many as 3,000 insurgents in the shrine area. The building the Marines plan to seize and occupy first is numbered 61 on coalition maps. It's an old hotel that's being refurbished. It's stripped clean of its contents. The building was basically a concrete frame with nothing in it except stairwells and rebar and a busted out elevator shaft. When Charlie Company reaches the location, 2nd Platoon, a 30-man unit under Lieutenant Chris Schickling, enters the hotel first. A platoon borrowed from 1st Recon Battalion stands by outside as backup. The Marines advance into a large open room on the ground floor and sweep it from front to back. Once you get into the uh, building, about, I would say about 15, 20 feet, and then all of a sudden, uh, one portion on the uh, right side would just drop off, and then you'd be looking in the basement. The Marines hear insurgents moving around down there. They also hear them shouting to each other on a floor above. The procedure is to clear a building from bottom to top, so a four-man fire team heads for the basement first. Each man braces for intense close combat that's no doubt just seconds away. At the front of the four-man team, leading the way down a winding staircase that's open on one side, is 21-year-old Lance Corporal Ryan Cullen Ward, a tough kid just two years in the Corps. He rounds a corner, and he runs right into a militiaman with an RPG. Basically, this guy's coming up the stairs, getting ready to kill Marines. We have Marines that are going down the stairs, getting ready to kill insurgents, and they're meeting in the middle. Cullen Ward is too close to use his rifle, so he reverts to his hand-to-hand -hand combat training. He brushes away the insurgent's RPG, then hammer fists him to the floor of the first stair landing. Cullen Ward grabs his K-Bar combat knife and jabs it into the militiaman's left temple. We heard the insurgent down there screaming at the base of the stairs, blood-curdling screams, and, you, you know, uh, screams of a guy who knows he's going to die. The militiaman bucks and wriggles his way out from under Cullen Ward off the side of the stairway landing. Cullen Ward, now in mild shock, turns and makes his way back to the top of the steps. Five other Marines rush past him toward the basement. They toss a grenade first, and then follow it down into the murky darkness. Suddenly, there's a second explosion. It's too dark to tell what caused it, but of the five Marines that went into the basement, four now have shrapnel wounds, one to a Marine's face. They had four casualties right off the get-go. The wounded men make their way out of the basement. Time for Lieutenant Schickling to reassess. With an unknown number of enemy fighters on floors both above and below his men, he needs backup. The lieutenant calls in the recon marines waiting outside and asks them to clear either the top floors or the basement. The remaining men of 2nd platoon will clear the other. The recon marines head for the basement, led by then gunnery sergeant Brian Yarlow. Prior to me turning the corner to go into the basement, I threw two grenades down the basement to get the uh, initial shot going. At the base of the steps, the Marines split up. Some peel to the left and the remainder clear to the right. The men on the right turn the corner and immediately discover an opening under the stairs. The first person yelled out, I got two of them here. There was an RPG team ready uh, that had a uh, RPG ready to fire at the platoon as it came down. Gunshots ring out, and the RPG shooters crash to the floor. Nearby, the Marines find a weapons cache. We ended up taking uh, 12 RPGs out of that, that basement. As the recon Marines are clearing the basement, Two fire teams from 2nd platoon reach the floor above the lobby. The teams, again, split in two directions. The team that goes right hears movement in a room in front of them. The Marines stack against the right wall of the hallway, one behind the other, in preparation for breaching the room. 
Then they toss in a flashbang grenade to throw the enemy inside off balance. But just as they charge for the door, an enemy hand grenade lands directly in front of them. Old City, Najaf, Iraq, August 25th, 2004, 12.30 a.m. In a dark, abandoned hotel, a Marine fire team rushes the doorway of a second floor room. Just as they reach it, an enemy hand grenade rolls onto the floor in front of them. The lead Marine sees the grenade and springs backward, knocking the rest of the Marines off their feet. The men are from the 2nd Platoon of Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 4th Marine Regiment, and they're clearing insurgent militiamen from an abandoned hotel labeled 61 on coalition maps. It's part of a Marine effort to gain a foothold in Najaf's old city. They're paving the way for an assault by friendly Iraqi troops on the Imam Ali Shrine, the refuge of most wanted insurgent leader, Muqtada al-Sadr. Now, here in the dark hotel, as the dust settles and the Marines scramble to regain their footing, Lance Corporal Ruben Cavallero rushes past them and into the room and confronts two militiamen with RPGs. He opens fire. The Marine beats the insurgents to the trigger and they crash to the floor. Sweeps of the remaining upper floors of the hotel yield no other militiamen. Building 61 is clear. The structure will now become the foothold the Marine assault needed. Fighting in Old City Najaf rages for another 30 hours. But Muqtada al-Sadr is finally forced to admit that his militia doesn't stand a chance. On August 27th, he agrees to a political deal to end the fighting. As we are within arm's reach of the shrine, a ceasefire is called. As part of the deal, Sadr will not be taken into custody. But the fighting in Najaf Cemetery in Old City has crippled his militia, and he's no longer a threat to the coalition. Pretty much in a matter of about two weeks, his organization was completely decimated of resources to do war and all of his top uh, lieutenants and captains. So he was pretty much left effective. Another of Iraq's most wanted criminals has been crossed off the list. But the search for most wanted desperados in Iraq is far from over. With the insurgency in full swing, the names of new villains are added to the most wanted list almost daily. And by January 2005, militants bent on spoiling the Iraqi elections have moved to the top of it. Fallujah, Iraq. January 30th, 2005, 8 a.m. Election day. Coalition forces are out to protect Iraqi polling places this morning. Iraq's most wanted insurgent criminals are out to kill voters. One particular insurgent mortar team has a unit of recon marines on their toes. They were precise, they were professional. They knew what they were doing. And uh, I mean, they, can, they could hit rounds on target. The recon Marines have tracked the movements of the mortar team for a couple of weeks, never able to catch them. They're vehicle mobile. They've been hitting Fallujah and they've been hitting uh, Abu Ghraib. They were running with impunity all through that area. Everyone in the local area, when we questioned them, they saw it, they were just afraid to stop it. But today, the Marines think they have a decent idea of where the team might show up. Sure enough, the mortar crew arrives, then jumps out of its vehicle in plain view of a recon sniper team hidden in a nearby building. There is an older man, probably the crew leader, and three younger men. All four are armed with AK-47 assault rifles. They set their position and they fired one round, and we hit them with a sniper position that was set up pretty much right behind them. We killed one immediately. Three took off into the canals. Sergeant Eric Cucker, 
Sergeant Heath Langto and a combat engineer chase them down to the water's edge. The insurgents dive into a tall growth of reeds and take cover. When the Marines get close... We were only probably 15 feet away. One of the insurgents opens up with an automatic burst of fire from his AK-47. My engineer was killed. Just missed his plate and uh, hit him in the chest. He missed almost the entire mag and it's just one shot that was, was just a lucky shot. I didn't think he was aiming. The two remaining Marines, Sergeants Cucker and Lankto, are armed with M4s, a shorter version of the M16 assault rifle. Cucker returns fire. I engaged him, put him down and then I immediately went to a full auto and just sprayed the area because I couldn't see them because they, they were in heavy reeds. All I saw was the muzzle barrel stick up. I knew he hit one, possibly wounded another. Now our job was to sweep through that and try and find out if there's anyone else down there. The two Marines toss several hand grenades into the reeds. And then Sergeant Langto pulls out his combat knife and rushes down into the water. Fallujah, Iraq. January 30th, 2005, 8.30 a.m. Marine Recon Sergeant Heath Langto is bracing himself for brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. Recon Marines got the drop on a notorious and most wanted insurgent mortar team this morning. They killed the leader of the four-man team, and now three of the Marines have chased the remaining mortarmen into a growth of reeds at a nearby riverbank. In a gun battle here at the riverbank moments ago, both the insurgents and the Marines lost a man. Now Sergeant Langto is plunging into the water and reeds to hunt down and kill the last two enemy fighters. He went down with, armed with pretty much just a knife because he was in chest high water and I held security for him. He ran into one of the second guys and he got into a, a scuffle with him, ended up slitting his throat and uh, drowned him into the water. Two most wanted insurgents down, one to go. But the third man isn't easy to find. And as the hunt continues, other Marines arrive at the scene. One of my corpsmen heard a guy cough in the brush, and the other guy was hiding right down there in the brush. And uh, we just, we didn't even notice him for almost an hour. An interpreter with the Marines orders the insurgent to come up with his hands in the air. The man doesn't acknowledge. He was just hiding there, hoping we didn't find him. And uh, we punched down, swept through. And uh, he came up at us, and uh, we ended up taking him out. The most wanted mortar crew has been eliminated. After that, the election station was not touched at all. But even with successful elections, insurgent violence in Iraq is far from over. In the early summer of 2005, an extremist Sunni group calling themselves Ansar al-Sunnah surfaces in the Mosul area and begins a reign of violence and kidnappings. Mosul, Iraq. June 8, 2005, 1 p.m. Major Andy Milburn, a U.S. Marine raised in the U.K., and three other Americans are working as advisors to a company of the Iraqi Intervention Forces, the IIF. The IIF is made up of Iraqi soldiers trained by the U.S. military and led by U.S. advisors. Most of the officers were former Republican Guard, Iraqi Special Forces guys. So they had friends who are either civilians or in some cases uh, insurgents. And from time to time, these guys would get calls and they'd be given some item of information regarding a hostage, regarding an arms cache, sometimes regarding um, an ambush, uh, an IED. The tips often come in as a result of one insurgent group trying to sabotage another. There's a tremendous amount of rivalry among the various insurgent groups. There is no one common insurgent group, and they don't even have common cause. Uh, it's a little like, um, uh, I equate it to, to gangs in the underworld. A tip has just arrived at IIF headquarters regarding the whereabouts of a hostage taken by the emerging insurgent group Ansar al Sunna. The captive is a female Iraqi journalist the insurgents have deemed a propagandist for the coalition. 
they were planning to execute her either that day or the day afterwards. Uh, so we knew we had to move quickly. The tip about the journalist's location does not specify the exact house where she is being held. It simply specifies a general area of town. It will take a concerted effort to find her. Here's the setup. A company of U.S. soldiers will cordon off the neighborhood. Then the IIF will place snipers atop empty buildings to provide overwatch security, while others search house to house for the journalist. With luck, they'll find her before the insurgents behead her. 2.10 p.m. The cordon is set, and three IIF soldiers, along with three U.S. advisors, approach a house to position a sniper. Major Milburn and Marine Staff Sergeant Julio Reyes are among them. You are watching actual video of the scene, because on this day, Staff Sergeant Reyes just happens to be experimenting with a small video camera his family has sent him. He has the camera strapped to his helmet and is recording as the group makes its approach on the front door of the structure. We're just going into supposedly empty building to set up a uh, overwatch on the roof. We're not expecting the, uh, the bad guys to be in this particular building. As the front two IIF soldiers breach the door, gunfire explodes from inside. Either they had heard us move into the, the area or they received a tip because they were actually waiting with the weapons pointing towards the front of the room, back in the room a little bit so we couldn't see them. So when our first two guys come in through the door, they shoot the first guy in the legs, he goes down and he crawls off towards the wall. Uh, they don't finish him off probably because they're, they're focused on the next guy, guy coming through the door. He gets shot two or three times in the chest and knocked out through the doorway. Amazingly, the man shot in the chest doesn't die. The armor plate in his flak vest deflects the bullets and saves his life. The kidnappers keep up sporadic fire as they escape into an adjacent room. Taken by surprise, the U.S. advisors outside quickly regroup. Then Major Milburn and an Army Special Forces officer charge into the smoky house to save their wounded comrade. We're yelling to him, where are they? You know, where are they? Um, at some risk to himself, he points to the corner room. The special forces officer tosses a grenade into the room and covers Milburn as he goes for the downed man. If armed insurgents burst from several rooms at once, it could be a massacre. Southwest Mosul, Iraq, June 8, 2005. 2.10 p.m. A small team of coalition troops has kicked an insurgent hornet's nest, and a man is down. On a search for a hostage taken by insurgents, three Iraqi intervention forces troops and three U.S. advisors, including Marine Major Andy Milburn and an Army Special Forces officer, approached a building they thought was empty. When the Iraqi soldier in front breached the door, Gunfire exploded from inside. The soldier went down, and the insurgents who shot him fled to a back room. Now, Major Milburn and the Special Forces officer have gone in to get their fallen comrade. The Special Ops officer tosses a grenade and covers Milburn as he goes for the bleeding Iraqi soldier. I grabbed this guy behind what we call his age harness behind his neck. I have no idea if his upper body's been hit too, and I start to drag him out. Now it's time to take out the kidnappers and find the hostage. While the remaining team members wait outside and watch for shooters on the roof, Milburn and the special forces officer go back in and enter the door of the room they fragged minutes earlier. They're no longer there. There's, there's a blood trail leading up through the window. We look out through the window and there's a little gap that they could get out without being seen by the cordon. With the immediate threat dealt with, the team now has time to find the female journalist and lead her to safety. She is very shaken up. She obviously has known uh, that her chances are not good. She was uh, 
very much in shock. We got her out and, and uh, took her to hospital. Outside, it appears the kidnappers escaped the court. But as the team searches an adjacent roof, they see movement in a window. He's in that window to the front, and he went around the corner. Don't know if it's a civilian. Don't know if it's one of these guys. And you see just a, uh, a white T-shirt. The guy's crouching down. We yell at him. Come out! Todd! And, uh, and he actually comes out and surrenders. And it, it was one of the insurgents. He'd thrown his weapon down, jumped into a house, hoping to escape through the house. It's been the first successful hostage rescue operation conducted by IIF forces and their advisors. And it's not surprising that the event occurred in Mosul. The city has long been a hotbed for insurgents. Just two years earlier, it was the site of the most high profile, most wanted shootout of them all. Northeast Mosul, Iraq, Battle Force Headquarters, July 21st, 2003. Army Major Scott Hooper, Operations Officer for 3rd Battalion, 327th Infantry Regiment, Battle Force, is greeting some unexpected visitors. They're SOF personnel, Special Operations Forces, and they're here to request assistance. They have received a tip from a friendly Iraqi that Saddam's sons, Uday and Kusay, are holed up in a nearby house. The brothers occupy spots numbers two and three on the list of Iraq's most wanted, and they're evil men, power-crazed sadists who murder, rape, and torture for pleasure. It's even reported that older brother Uday has ordered the torturing of small children. Major Hooper and his boss, Lieutenant Colonel Rick Carlson, aren't convinced that the tip about the brothers' whereabouts is valid. They suspect it's a trap, but planning to help with the capture operation begins anyway. What risk do you assume by not following through? When you're going after guys like this, you know, it's probably better to go after them. And then if what, the worst thing that could happen is there's nobody there. Here's the setup. A team of 30 special ops guys, armed with M4 assault rifles, will make the actual raid on the house. Major Hooper and Lieutenant Colonel Carlson's 300 conventional soldiers will cordon off a five-block area of the neighborhood around the house to prevent possible escape. The operation receives the code name Tapeworm. It's set to go down the next day at 10 a.m. July 22nd, 2003, 9.30 a.m. The Special Forces troops and Battle Force soldiers approach Objective Tapeworm. The target is a well-constructed two-story private residence on a main avenue in northeast Mosul. 0942, I gave them the code word Tapeworm to set the cordon. By 9.47, the cordon was set. The assault force was at the door. The assault force initiated by ringing the doorbell and then leading with a bullhorn, basically uh, through an interpreter, uh, telling them to come out. We want to come in. We like to search your house, open the doors, raise your hands, and uh, let us do what we need to do. The bullhorn is answered by sudden bursts of automatic rifle fire from inside the building. The shootout is on. So at that point, you know, the whole soft approach of, of trying to give them an opportunity to turn up uh, went away, and, and all bets were off. An entry team of four special ops guys breaches the front door. The enemy is barricaded in a room at the top of a stairway. Once the assault element did get through the door, they started receiving a heavy volume of fire. I don't know if they had created a firing hole or something through the door in the, in the room that they were barricaded in, but immediately the assault forces received fire and actually suffered some casualties right after getting in the door. The wounded entry team pulls back out of the building to regroup. Facing such stiff resistance, the special ops forces now ask Hooper and Carlson's men who have cordoned the area to open fire on the house with their heavy weapons. 
50 caliber machine guns mounted on Humvees hammer into the stucco surface of the building. When the machine guns hit the outside of the structure, it basically broke the, the exterior apart, uh, but it did not penetrate. It was uh, built to last. Uh, it, was, it was a hideout safe house for them. Then suddenly, a second threat emerges from an unexpected location. Our forces begin to receive fire uh, from across the street. There was a pink house across the street. I heard the gunfire and I picked my head up. And the guy was shooting off the balcony. One of Major Hooper's soldiers, a specialist named Brown, is hit by the shooter. It penetrated under Specialist Brown's armpit and exited through his back somewhere. And so he was in pretty bad shape at the time. Instantly, other soldiers nearby unleash punishing fire toward the balcony of the pink house. The shooting from the house stops. But it's now clear to Major Hooper and Lieutenant Colonel Carlson that they need to wrap up this mission as soon as possible before it gets out of hand. They step up the firepower. Then we began firing TOWs. TOWs are wire-guided anti-tank missiles. The gunner who fires them controls their flight with a joystick. The missile actually remains attached to the controller through a tiny wire filament over two miles long that uncoils from the back of the missile as it rockets toward the target. The gunner needs to guide and track the missile, just like in a video game where you keep the crosshairs on the target holds a steady aim on the target, and that's where the missile goes. The missiles soon smash into the Hussein Brothers' safe house. It took a couple to penetrate. That's how thick the concrete was. We did have a couple shots uh, go right through the window. Soon, Apache attack helicopters arrive and start singing rockets into the roof of the building. By 1.30 p.m., enemy fire from the target house ceases completely. Special ops teams now breach the front door and see the devastation. Absolute and total destruction. Rubble everywhere, chairs just shattered, tables everywhere, chunks of wall, mattresses and stuff just shredded. The SOF guys breach the upstairs door. When they enter, Uday, Kuse, and a bodyguard are sprawled on the floor, dead. But there's still a threat. Immediately upon entry, they've received gunfire from either Uday or Kuse's 14-year-old son underneath one of the beds. The assault forces, they immediately, immediately killed him. It's a situation no soldier ever wants to face. But the men who were there believe the youth gave them little choice. Killing a boy is not a natural act. However, when that boy is toting a gun and firing that weapon, it's, it's a pretty quick decision cycle, and it's not a very difficult decision at the time. Within minutes, Uday and Kusei's bodies are whisked away for positive identification. And at 11 p.m., word comes down from higher headquarters. Numbers two and three on the tally of Iraq's most wanted have been officially crossed off the list. The hunt for Iraq's most wanted continues. As long as the country remains unstable, there'll be no shortage of thugs attempting to grab power through terror and murder. And it's clear the killers aren't particularly selective about their victims. Anyone in Iraq will do. Coalition troops, international journalists, innocent Iraqi civilians, just as long as the death causes despair and disruption. It's a cruel and despicable legacy of a wicked regime. But as long as the slaughterers persist, coalition forces will continue to track down and eliminate Iraq's most wanted.